the summer at the great universities and scientific institutions all around the world, the Moscow Academy of Science, the Polish Academy of Learning, the University of Paris, people began getting varnished wooden cylinders. And I assume it said, like, you know, Professor Smith, Austin. And maybe he said, the Rice Institute Houston. I'm just a magical thought. I've never heard of the Rice Institute. Never heard of Houston. <laughs> What's in, what, what is this? This beautiful shellac tube. And they open this tube up. In this tube, on the lampstand, was an invitation. An invitation to end all invitations. The president and the trustees of the Rice Institute, yeah. having resolved you know, to observe the formal opening of the new university, they invite, this is to the president of the University of Cincinnati, from all over the world, these grand invitations. And wrapped up here is kind of a paper version of a program. If you just imagine this, you don't, invitations like this don't come very often. And people must have been amazed. This kind of invitation from a new university arrived. And Lovett sent 1,400 invitations. And he planned, planned a three-day celebration with concerts. And we went back from Princeton reading an ode just composed for the occasion. And 12 great speakers, Nobel laureates, great scholars and mathematicians and historians and botanists and chemists from, from Tokyo and from, and from Cambridge and from London and from Paris and from Rome and from Germany. Amazing who's who of academicians to get formal papers. And they all began to congregate in Houston. According to the New York Times, they've never seen such an assemblage of talent. And there were three long days and the presence of Cambridge, you know, of Johns Hopkins and Chicago and Harvard, they all came. It's an amazing celebration. Here's the program for those who came. Printed in a lampstand with the right seal embossed. Spectacularly beautiful print. The program of a formal opening of the Rice Institute with a picture of William Marsh Rice. And it has spread throughout the campus, clan. It has beautiful watercolors of some of the first buildings. Look at this, that's an old little glass. And then it lists the speakers and so forth. People are just amazed. The provost uh, Chancellor Kirkman at Vanderbilt wrote a letter that I've never seen such invitations in the program in life. Sir Ramsey, a Nobel laureate in chemistry, went back to England. And his wife, Lady Ramsey, wrote back to me, Mr. Lovett, said, we've been to a lot of opens all over the world, but never an opening such as this. The great Hugo de Vries, the Dutch botanist, <coughs> stopped on a ship in New York to love the Lovett, said, I was amazed at the spectacular nature of your opening. And then on the Saturday, the last day, <coughs> Dr. Lovett gave an address to, to this assembled group called the meaning of the new institution, in which he spelled out his ambition for the Rice Institute. Starting small, he said, but we aspire to be a great university. We hope one day to take our state, ourselves, take our seat on the stage with the Cambridges and Hoxfords and the Thorns of the world. And he called for honor system. He called for residential colleges. He called for graduate work. He called for undergraduates and graduates and faculty intermingling together and talking and learning together. He had all those little phrases to keep the numbers down and the standards up. He talked, for, talked about faculty having the, the, the pleasures of teaching and the privilege of research. He talked about the importance of, of keeping uh, athletics and uh, education in balance. And he called for the students to be involved in any murals. Basically, even today, when we were trying to do, when we were sort of living up to our highest ideals, we're living up to the vision. We're carrying out the vision of Edgar and Del Lovett. And more than any other university I've ever heard of, Rice 
question briefly goes to that sort of cliche the length and shadow of one man. His vision, his speech. It's a long, ornate speech with a kind of rhetoric that's not particularly fashion today, but love it as a person with an incredible ability to write beautiful letters. If you start reading his letters, you're just amazed at the kind of letters he writes. And he's he, I'm impressed with time here, not supposed to stop a little bit. But I mean, he says things I know he's hardly present here. When he uh, uh, he gets a letter from a young man in Boma and Harry Weiss, he does Probably knows who Harry Weiss is. And Harry Weiss says, Thank you, I'm glad to hear you come to the new institutions that I well remember that day when you conveniently forgot my absence at Princeton. And the letter went back a nice little note to him. Well, what Harry Weiss doesn't say is that he was a student at Princeton, he was in Dr. Lovett's class. And Princeton at that time had a policy that if you were a day or so late coming back from a, a major vacation, you were expelled. Weiss was coming back from Beaumont, and there was an ice and snowstorm, and his train was delayed, and he wasn't able to get back to Princeton in time for classes. And if Lovett had turned him in, he would have been expelled. But he told Lovett to follow him, so Lovett forgot to mark his absence. Dr. Mr. Weiss remembered that, and later when Weiss is chairman of Humble Law, Humble Law, and on the Rice Trustees, uh, you know, <laughs> but he had you know, when people die in the community. Let it write each one of them in his immaculate handwriting notes that are just beautiful. I mean, he had an elegance of writing that stunned. At the end of his three-day celebration, a special train carried the whole assembled group down to Galveston, where the Galvez Hotel was just started. And they had a great so-called short dinner. And then early the next morning, they rode the train back to Houston. And there was a great city-wide religious ceremony downtown for this new institution. And the Rice Institute was launched. One of my favorite little letters is the president of the University of New Mexico was one of those who had come to the opening. And after, after, after the ceremonies are over, he goes back to Albuquerque. And he writes a letter back to Mrs. Lovett. And he says, I can hardly help noticing that Dr. Lovett, who had worked so hard and planned so long for this great opening, that when it finally happened, he could hardly control his emotions. Particularly when he said, it all came off more grand than he ever imagined. It was an amazing. This institution that love is found out inspired a whole generation. And love it took all those lectures and was one of the first graduates of Isaac Sanders, who was the last surviving member of the class in 1916. Went to New York and worked a whole summer having those lectures published in three great volumes, published at the same printer that had published that Princeton book. And we know it as Three grandly designed and printed volumes commemorated the opening ceremonies. And Lovett had 1,400 copies of that three volume set sent to the great libraries and universities of the world, announcing the creation of a new university. What Lovett had in mind was not just simply saying we're starting, but to announce a vision to articulate an ambition, to lay out the idea that this could be a great university in a region of the country that was a thousand miles from another great university. Rice may have been better known in 1915 than now. It's amazing how that gamble played off. Love it continues as president until 1940. In 1941, he sends a little note to the trustees saying he's said it's time for him to retire. The trustees ask him to go ahead and serve, if you will, through the course of the war. And so he does serve until William B. Houston is appointed the second vice president on the last day of 1945. But when the word got out that Dr. Lovett was retiring, really poignant letters poured into it from 
fact, Billy could serve with him from the very beginning. Letters from people like Alan McKellen, the price people went up. One of my favorite letters from William Ward Watkin. William Ward Watkin was chairman of our country for all those years. He had been trained at the University of Pennsylvania, and he was the person in the Crown Ferguson Goodlow office who came down to Rice to make sure that the campus was built the way our campus was built out. And then he came with say on the Rice as chairman of architecture. So William Ward Watkin had been with Dr. Levin since 1910. And here, they're both old men. And Dr. Levin is retiring. And William Ward Watkin sends this note, a little handwritten note, to Dr. Levin. He says, out of the marsh and swamps of this campus, you have brought beauty and fineness at every step along the way. Into its building you have woven your life with all its clearness and kindness. All that you see about us is yours in every sense, creative, nurturing, and fulfilling toward an enduring being. It will ever be yours. In 1947, the administration building was renamed Leather Hall, and a bronze plaque was placed on the north There's some nice little words in English in that letter. And then in Greek, there is a saying of this bronze standard. He has built himself an institution more lasting than bronze. This is William Marsh Rice University because Mr. Rice made a fortune and had the vision of establishing some kind of education. But in every other way, this is the university. Edgar O'Dell loved it, envisioned, put into place, and nurtured. And that nurturing vision sustains us even today. Thanks very much. Very 
small. Universities at this time were all very small. And the first class, I'd say, has something like 77 students. And it grows very slowly. And so he, he's imagining by, say, something like 1924 or so, maybe having a total of 1,200 students. But actually, if you look at the size of places like Hopkins and Columbia and Princeton and so forth, they, they, they all have fewer than 2,000 students. So universities are very small. And, and, and within 10 years, they're having to severely limit the size of the student body because there's just too many students trying to come. So, you know, even though there are those kind of racial and what appear to be geographical restrictions, say a northern geographical, and begin to sort of chip away at the uh, racial in terms of letting in some Hispanic students, some Japanese students, some Chinese students, students from Italy, Mexico, something you know, so forth. So it's very slow. Uh, one interesting thing I did forget to say is uh, I mentioned Mr. Rice was a very shrewd businessman. In 1878, he bought 49,000 acres of uh, timberland in Louisiana that Rice just sort of held. And then they got ready to build a campus in 1909. The trustees, you can see in their minutes, they sell the right to cut the timber on that Louisiana uh, timberland. And then at first, they cut all the trees. And they get $3.5 million for this tree. This is on land that Mr. Rice had bought. $48,000. And that $3.5 million builds all the original buildings on campus, but about half left over. So, you know, now the rice gets about $7 million a year selling the timber on a rotating basis. But I mean, it's one of those investments that rice makes that turns out to have a value. Just astronomical compared to what he spent for it. And yet, that okay enough? enough? Okay? Um, because Rice wanted this institute to be for men and women, and which was, I guess, very non-traditional as far as some of the other universities wow. in, in um, admitting women, where where did that come from, or why was why did he recognize that women? Um, well, I, you know, I don't know, but I mean, I, I say you know, at the beginning, he knew about Peter Cooper Institute in New York, and the Peter Cooper Institute in New York was mm -hmm. coeducational. So it may have been. I mean, I think he got the idea from that. Uh, and there were some co-educational colleges at that time. Most, mostly they weren't. I mean, I'll find the all men, for example. Right. Uh, so it's hard to know. I mean, he never does write down, you know, I got this idea from. But it does seem that that is the origin of the idea because he, because he didn't clearly know about it. 